Hi, I'm Dr. Bill Adams, and this is No Spin Live, everybody's favorite show to get the real story from the world's best plastic surgeons. With us today, we have Charlie Mesa from Weston, Florida, Jason Posner from Boca Raton, Florida, and Dan Del Vecchio from Boston, Massachusetts. I wanted to start off today just, you know, Super Bowl now. We know who's playing, Atlanta Falcons versus the New England Patriots. I want to get you guys picks. I want to maybe put some money in Las Vegas. Uh, Charlie, who do you like? Uh, the Patriots, for sure. Dan Del Vecchio, I'm sure that we uh, know who you're going to be for, but any, any comments you'd like to make? Patriots by 10. Jason? Don't care. I grew up in Atlanta. I'm going for the Falcons. Speaking of the Super Bowl, did you see this story? I just saw it today about the girl that uh, saying she's going to get a breast augmentation the week of the Super Bowl, and she wants to do a quick recovery of breast augmentation so she can get back to see the Super Bowl really quick. Is that the real deal, you guys think? Or what do you think, Dan? I think she has a good PR agent. Listen, here's the deal. Super Bowl, what do we think of? Pickup trucks, beer, Viagra, right? So throw in some breast implants. It's a good compliment. Jason, that's a that's a crazy story, don't you think? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Look, look, Bill's really the quick recovery, you know, doctor on this on this particular call. I end up on the more revision side of things. But, you know, basically, if, after your breast talk, I don't care if you sit in bed and watch the Super Bowl and drink some beer anyway. So whether it's a quick recovery or not, doesn't matter to me. It's humorous, but uh, I think it's a little marketing ploy. So let's move on to the topics. Actually, the first thing is we had to revisit. Just two weeks ago, we were talking about this person, Danielle Lloyd, who was saying that she felt horrible about the plastic surgery she has. Now she's, she thinks that uh, it's great. Jason, I mean, what, what's going on here? I'm confused. You know, Bill, we've been over this again and again with these celebrities. They love their plastic surgery. They hate their plastic surgery. I think they're just looking for attention. And these people are no names. You don't hear this from any of the big names. It's just people looking for attention because their star is falling. Charlie, uh, what do you think about this? I think this is a typical scenario where we have a woman who's had multiple plastic surgeries, so she hates her results because she doesn't look the way she wants, but finally she gets the right operation by the right doctor and gets fixed. So therefore now she loves plastic surgery. So it's, it's very much an emotional roller coaster she put herself on. She was disgusted. Now she thinks she's re-energized. She loves her result. I mean, she's shown like a 10-day post-op on this picture that's in this story. What's the deal? The deal is not everyone saw the first story and only people with an IQ over 100 are going to put the two together. Look, here's the deal. <laughs> people flip-flop all the time. Look at politicians. This is just the PR ploy. The bigger picture here is we, we're seeing with social media an, a, a real increase in the amount of these media, I don't want to use the W word, but these media attention grabbers. And you're right, there are people who are no names, there are people who aren't that popular, they're using plastic surgery, they're using us, they're using our profession as a stepping stone for publicity. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the one thing about this story that has some weight, I think, is that she's at least now acknowledging that when you make rash decisions and she went and had some procedures done just because she thought she was young and it was the right thing to do, but you, you, gotta, you gotta think about who's gonna do your plastic surgery, what you're gonna have done, and make sure that the person knows what they're doing and is, is qualified and is an expert. The second story, that, uh, the Botox monster story, um, also, I don't know what's going on, Jason and Charlie, but these are all these people from Florida, so I'm not sure what kind of state you guys live in, but this patient, apparently very nice lady, had Botox and fillers done, it sounds like. You guys saw the story, it's pretty incredible sequence and photos they have in there. I mean, Jason, uh, why don't you lead off? What do you think? Okay. Well, you know, the first thing is that you're, you're not making to an erroneous uh, suggestion that we live in Florida that these problems are happening. In Florida, there's a lot of unlicensed providers coming up from South America who are injecting lots of weird stuff in people's faces. So this particular case to me does not look like a problem with Botox. It looks like a filler infection gone way bad. You know, there's also infections that can happen in good providers, but we also see them in bad providers. I'm currently taking care of a patient now who got silicone injected somewhere in South Florida and has mycobacteria infection. She now has a pick line in and getting, you know, six weeks of antibiotics, and it's a mess. So these things can happen. You need to go to good providers. We deal with a lot of these problems that can potentially happen. And I've never seen anyone look like that. Dan Del Vecchio, what did you think about this? Jason's right. There are, you know, board certified licensed professionals who do injections to get infections. And a lot of the time it's due to the reusable cannula. So I think that one of the things that this story really 
you know, suggest is that we should mandate single-use cannulas for facial injections. In South Florida, you get a lot of South American patients that are very comfortable going to someone's house to get injected. And as a result, you have a lot of black market plastic surgery where people are going literally to someone's garage and are getting fillers. And the person injecting is not licensed and not experienced. They tell them it's Botox, they tell them it's Juvederm, but it ends up being uh, biopolymerose or some type of silicone derivative, which ends up causing an intense inflammatory reaction in a non-sterile environment. So now you've got, got an infection, you got too much filler, an uncontrolled inflammatory reaction, and it just a <coughs> snowball effect that just can potentially destroy their face. And that's kind of what we saw here in this patient. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously the facts are not totally lined up in the story because it says Botox, it's definitely, it's not going to be Botox, it's definitely a filler injection, but it could be either an infection or it could have been some sort of intravascular type uh, injection that where you embolized and, and you lost skin, but it's a, it's a bad complication. Okay, let's move on to uh, this story that uh, is also, I think, out of Florida. Uh, this must be coincidence, guys, but you know, it's this lady, it's, this actually came from the Daily Mail. Uh, in England, reported on this, this lady had breast implants for over 10 years, um, started having all these different symptoms, didn't know what it was caused from, had a big, big workup and eventually had her breast implants removed and now she's saying that it was mold within the breast implants that was causing all these symptoms. It's a little bit of a strange story and I think uh, the one part of it, somebody did say this is a really rare event, but I'm interested in you guys' take on this. Um, Charlie, you want to start off? People often come to me and say, you know, I'm worried about my implants have mold in them. Yeah, the, the problem with this patient is she had probably some type of a contaminant introduced at the time of surgery. Not using a closed technique to put saline into the implant caused some type of bacteria and or mold uh, fungus to get into the implant. And over time, it just uh, continued to grow and to faster and create uh, systemic symptoms. So. It's, it's not about the implants turning bad over time, it's more about the technique at the time that the surgery was done. Jason, what do you think about this? I, I've seen this a couple of times, okay? So what I agree with Charlie 100% on this. So the reason people have mold in their saline breast implants, you're not going to ever see them with silicone mm -hmm. unless someone pokes a silicone implant, is open, open fill systems. So what they used to do in Florida back maybe 20 years ago, Take, they used to take saline, dump it in a bowl, it would sit out during the case, and then they'd fill the implant from the open system. And this is what happened. And there were mold cases because there's spores flying around all over the place. And that's why it happened. I pulled out a few sets of saline implants over the years that did have mold. Exceedingly rare, but I have seen it at least twice, maybe a third time, I don't remember. What do they look like when they have mold black, cases? Black crap floating around the inside of the implant. It's mold. It's a, it's a fungus. Okay, so you're okay. not going to see it with, ever with the silicone. This all started though because people don't feel good. They feel they don't feel good. They look on the internet and they say, "Oh, it must be my saline breast implants because I don't feel good." Pull them out, and you know what? If you have mold, maybe there could be some association, but I think it's pretty damn rare. And I, again, I haven't seen it for a long time. And this was all from stuff 20 years ago. And I think all of those saline implants have pretty much been changed out by now. Yeah, I would say that based on what you guys are, have alluded to, that if you're practicing the techniques we know are kind of high level breast augmentation techniques, you're never going to get mold in a breast implant. This is basically a, it's basically a, a faulty technique being used to fill saline breast implants. So once again, the overlying theme is make sure you go to somebody that knows what they're doing, make sure they're an expert and have all the certification. Okay, that's good stuff. So this final story uh, that I, I want us to touch on is actually Kybella. So it's Allergan's new product. It's this magical, non-surgical, fat dissolving product injected in the office. Can It's approved now to remove fat, submental fat under the chin. So Dan, uh, what do you think about Kybella? Well, I think this is very similar to cool sculpting in the sense that there's a huge population of patients who will never have lipo. And, you know, cool sculpting may not be as effective as lipo, but it serves a market that's much bigger. And I think the same applies here in the sense that there are just a lot of patients who just would never consider lipo, not even of the neck. And if you can give them even a 30 to 40 to 50 percent equivalent improvement with an injectable drug, I think that's huge. 
JP, what do you think? So, you know, this started with Kythera Pharmaceuticals, who took mesotherapy and spent over $250 million in R&D in figuring out what the active ingredient was and getting the dose response curves. They got it, they took it to market, they took it public and then sold the company to Allergan. The best thing about Kybella is that Allergan is spending money on direct-to-consumer advertising. Because you turn on the Super Bowl, you turn on these other ads, and you see all these people with improving necks. And I gotta tell you, whoever they hired to do their uh, commercials are excellent. Because they're great commercials. So I think the product works. I've had it done. I've had it done four times. I had a, I think I had a really good result to my neck with it. But at age 55, I think it was good. I have decent quality skin. Charlie, love it, like it, or hate it? Uh, I like it, uh, and like like Dan said, it's it's another tool in our armamentarium to improve the neck. I, I agree with what Jason was saying. It's really important that patients know it's not going to make their skin tighter in most cases. So they may need some type of neck lift or, or some type of um, skin tightening procedure in conjunction with it. You don't. It's not a be all end all. I'll get one injection. Next thing you know, all my fat's gone in the neck, and I think that's kind of what people think. I'm going to get a couple injections. Next thing you know, I have a nice, smooth, tight neck, and that really doesn't happen. So it all goes back to patient education. Yeah, I think you guys are right. I think it's a it's a it's a great product. It's a different market. I think it's targeting. I've even used it in when the little fat women get right here in anterior axilla area, and it, and it works great there. So I think it's going to be really successful. Well, listen, guys, it's been really good information. I hope you enjoyed this episode of No Spin Live. You can see a lot more of this on the PlasticSurgeryChannel.com.